job is to put a hoop, a willow hoop, in the base of these four sticks. Willow is the perfect wood to work with because it's so flexible. The frame of the coracle can be lashed together with all sorts of materials, but I'm going to use this, which is rawhide, rawhide lacing. And this has been made moist, so it's flexible. As it dries, it will go stiff and it will shrink and bind the materials tightly together. Rawhide is just animal skin that's been cleaned and stripped of its hair. Many Indian tribes relied heavily on the buffalo for their livelihood, using every single part of the animal. Now I'm going to put the ribs in, which give it a lot more strength, and gradually it'll come to shape. Finding the willow quite difficult this time of year. It's certainly a lot uh, drier than it would have been a month or so ago. But that's all part of the challenge when you work with these sorts of materials. What I want to do is to start to fit in some ribs, and I want these to have not to be round underneath, I want the, the bottom of the boat to be flat if possible, it'll be a little bit more stable. The number of ribs will vary according to the boat and uh, that's not looking too bad at the moment so I think I'm going to put a few cross ribs, now long ones, in and see where that takes us. Look. Nice up right. I took the hoop out because it's easier to bend the willows without it there, but I have to put it back to make the structure sturdy. Once the edges are tidied up, I leave the rawhide to dry and tighten in the sun while I fashion a needle to sew the hide into the willow frame. As long as you've got sharp tools with you, it's simple to make everything you need from the available materials. There are uh, two ways of attaching the hide. You can just tie it on on the inside to the ribs or you can do like I'm doing here, which is to sew it on around the edge. I think this is the more sturdy method, perhaps the way Jim Bridger would have organised his boat. Where the ribs protrude, I'm just scoring a cross shape through the hide there, and then pushing the skin down on that, so it helps peg it in place. This is the tail, and the tails were left on, so that when several boats are in use, these could be used to tie them together. Sort of a, a ready-made painter, if you like. The river is flowing fast, so I'm going to need a strong paddle. I'm hoping this piece of wood will make a paddle. Depends whether I can split it or not but uh, I didn't fell it, beavers felled this. You can see their, their teeth marks where they've taken it down. So they're helping me out. What I'm doing, I'm just making simple wedges. A bit of board here lying around, ideal. The principle of bushcraft is that always make the tool that makes the job easier. Trying to do it without investing the time in making a tool is uh, the hard way.
So that's more or less it. It's just a crude paddle. It's not a, a, a big plush one for paddling a canoe. But it's better to carve a paddle like this from a solid piece of wood than to do the, the opposite, which is to take a, a sapling and split it and put a board in and lash it in. This is much stronger and more stable. And the water I'm going to be moving the boat on, well, it's shifting. And I just like that little extra bit of security of a proper paddle. So, well, an hour to make it. It's nothing really, is it? It was a boat just like this one that Jim Bridger built and he went on his major expedition down the Bear River. Not an easy boat to steer by all accounts. And they were a bit tippy so I'm going to get in very carefully, a bit gingerly even. Yeah. Very tippy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's all right. It handles surprisingly well, quite responsive. It's a brilliant piece of ingenuity. Bridger was a man of action, not words. He built one of these to settle a bet about the course of the Bear River. With his boat complete, he hopped in and set off. Following the river through the mountains, he saw a huge lake. The story goes that his boat seemed more buoyant than before, so he tasted the water and found that it was salty. He was the first white man to discover Utah's great salt lake. Actually, they're actually very maneuverable once you get the hang of it. It's just about sculling. Fantastic. You've got to hand it to Bridger and his pioneering spirit. He must have taken some guts to set off in something as flimsy as this, never knowing what might be waiting for him round the next bend. Today, there are still a few mountain men left. This is Jake Carell. He's a trapper who grew up here and has worked these mountains for years. And how long have you been trapping? 83 years. I started when years. I was seven and I'm now 90. <laughs> I'm still at it. You don't look 90. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of young guys can't keep up with me what I do, you know. <laughs> I don't never chum around with people my age. I can't stand them. They slow me up too much. <laughs> <laughs> Any changes in your life as you grown older? Well, my sex life changed. I, I can plow as deep as I ever could, but I can't make as many rhymes. <laughs> 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 and looks like the traps are missing. I bet I got one here. Uh, I see the wire going in. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll pull it up. We might have something here. Yeah, I got yeah. a a kit beaver. A little old kit beaver, and he's about three between three and four months old. By the time they're six months old, they do d almost as much uh, damage as a, an old big beaver does. Jake, have you ever caught yourself in one of these traps? Yeah, I'll show you my fingers. They, they, and several times they went off, and, and after so many times, why, they don't heal too good anymore. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people think we're cruel people because we're trappers, but I think we're some of the best conservationists they've got, you know. You have to have a control on these 